Welcome to the Kay Bailey Hutchison Center for Energy Law and Business Energy Week at the University of Texas. Today, we're hosting a webinar as part of Energy Week on carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. As it is commonly referred to by many, we will use the acronym CCUS today to describe it. I'm JJ McNelly. I'm a projects partner at Bracewell and co-head of the firm's oil and gas practice. I'm a double alum at the University of Texas with business and law degrees from the university. I'll be co-moderating today, along with Pam Giblin, the senior policy advisor for the Climate Leadership Council. Bracewell is a leading law firm in the energy space with a burgeoning practice focused on climate change, CCUS, sustainability in the energy transition, and offers a unique perspective on this movement given its transactional, regulatory, and policy focus. Bracewell advised on a number of matters related to CCUS over the years, including Petronova Project, which was the largest operated CO2 capture to EOR project here in Southeast Texas for, for a number of years until taken offline in 2020. Storega Technologies, acquisition of Pale Blue Dot. Energy, who is the lead developer of one of the first carbon capture projects in storage projects in the UK. Numerous gas storage matters, including acting for leading LNG exporter and sequestration projects along the Gulf Coast tax, environmental, and regulatory advice with projects up and down the value chain of CCUS. And finally, we recently published The Way Forward, which offers a legal and commercial primer on CCUS projects in the United States and was recently published in the Texas Journal of Oil, Gas, and Energy Law. Dan Jurgen, in his recent book, The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations, has proclaimed we're at the outset of the next energy transition. According to Jurgen, we are currently undertaking an effort to back away from oil and gas and coal with the main driver. Now, he extols, it's not energy security as in past decades, but climate and the mobilization around it. Dan Pickering of Pickering Energy Partners has chimed in with his usual sage advice by saying, for those dismissing the energy transition as a fad, don't. The world is headed towards lower carbon. Investors and capital markets have recently been fleeing the energy space. Hardly a day goes by where a hedge fund, private equity, or a pension fund doesn't say they're divesting their energy investments due to the environmental and ESG costs attributable to these investments. And at the same time, it is daily that we read about investing in capital flows to what is called green finance, as it was referred to in the Wall Street Journal the other day. The trends at the forefront of the capital flows and by every measure are accelerating rapidly by the day. All this comes at a time when nations are scrambling to curb their industrial emissions to meet guidance set forth by climate experts and limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, the world continues to grow as developing nations continue to push forward, demanding more energy, transportation, and raw materials. Despite the need for current emissions to decrease 4.7 billion tons per annum, the IEA forecasts that industrial CO2 emissions will instead increase from 8 to 10 billion tons per annum by 2060. With that as our backdrop, carbon capture provides a means to adjust transition as it currently the only transition technology that permits the industrial processes that are necessary to power modern, modern life without significant displacement of industrial professionals or the need to retire proven sources of energy. For those here in the great state of Texas over the past week, we have a newfound appreciation for reliability in existing proven sources of energy. Today, we plan here in our webinar to explore these tensions between the old ways and the new map that Jurgen speaks of. The program we have planned here will start out focusing on policy, academia, and governmental efforts to regulate a carbon transition. We will then move up to the front lines of Jurgen's clash and talk to a few of the first movers on the business side trying to earn a profit from lower carbon initiatives in the energy space. Finally, we will conclude with some discussions about the recent changes, federal tax incentives, as well as thoughts from a capital provider immersed in financing the changes. Before I turn it over to my co-moderator, a quick word about the structure of the webinar today. Uh, we have six different speakers who will each run over a slide deck describing their touches with CCUS. They will each speak around 10 minutes, and then we'll answer questions from the audience and the moderators immediately after their slide decks. 
At the end, if we have extra time, we will work in more questions. To ask questions, you can just see the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that. When you have a question aimed at a particular speaker, please indicate which speaker the question is intended for. We've got six speakers today uh, at the beginning of the question. With so many attendees, uh, this will add to the efficiency of the processing as, of, of many questions as possible. So with me today as co-moderator is Pam Giblin. Pam is a senior policy advisor for the Climate Leadership Council, which was founded by former Secretary of State James Baker and George Schultz. Prior to her current position, Pam was a partner at Baker Botts, where she was a trailblazer in environmental law and regularly advised clients on issues related to air quality and climate. Pam has served as a past president of the American College of Environmental Lawyers and on the Clean Air Act Advisory Committee established by Congress to advise the EPA. Pam also serves on the Executive Council of the KBH Center here at UT. Pam is a double alum from UT, just like me, with a bachelor's and a law degree. Pam, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, before I get started, I want to brag on the K. Bailey Hutchison Institute, because when I first joined, one of the things that we were committed to was, was really tapping the diverse areas of expertise of the university and trying to be multidisciplinary so that we weren't looking at something in a silo. And of all the institutes that I have looked at, KBH does it better than anybody. And I think today's webinar is a perfect example because you can talk about multidisciplinary get togethers and, and cross fertilization of expertise, but this is a case study. Uh, and it's so much easier to do it when you're talking about a specific topic. And as you'll see from the background of our speakers and their presentations, they're really bringing a whole array of, of insights that any one discipline be it the law school or the you know Macomb School or one of those one of those sort of more specialized colleges would not have. So kudos to Ambassador Hutchison for having that vision of, of trying to make this as multidisciplinary as possible. So it's been a real pleasure working with with the institute and on this seminar particularly where, we, where we're trying to give you a flavor for all of the various issues regardless of, of what you do, whether you're a, an engineer or a business person or a lawyer, there is something about this topic that's going to affect your life. Okay, now our first speaker is Drew Nelson, and we're very lucky to have him, but he is the Clean Energy Program Officer at the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation. And as most of you know, George Mitchell pioneered the economic development of shale. You know, he's the father of fracking. And so if, if, any, if any founding member of an organization brought an appreciation of what's needed to really maintain energy as a, as a, as a source of, of fuel in, in, in our life going forward, it was George Mitchell. So, so Drew is with the foundation. Drew has more than 15 years working on energy and climate issues before it was fashionable. He works on finding solutions that both reduce emissions and increase economic development. He previously served as Director of International Affairs for the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, and then prior to that, he worked for the U.S. Department of State on international climate negotiations. He holds a master's degree in policy in Latin American studies from UT with a concentration in, in environmental policy. So again, a stellar UT alum with a broad background, Drew, give us your perspectives. Uh, thanks, Pam. And you forgot the part of my bio where it says I'm a card-carrying member of the Pam Giblin fan club, too. Oh, no. So, um, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thanks to the 289 of you out there who are spending part of your morning with us. It, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be having this conversation. Um, and Pam really kind of hit on the, the, the overall theme here, of, you know, why is a foundation involved in the carbon capture utilization space? Um, and it's because Mr. Mitchell was, a, was an innovator who was passionate about sustainability. Uh, and I think CCUS fits squarely in that framework. It allows for growth of key parts of the Texas economy uh, without the bad impacts, without the nasty air pollution, or without the, the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and that's particularly important for the industrial sector 
where Texas uh, leads the country in industrial emissions. It's also an important part of uh, the Texas economy. And in fact, on industrial emissions, uh, Texas is bigger, almost as big as the second and third biggest states combined. So we have a lot uh, of reductions to be had, uh, and, and we have a lot of economic incentive to make sure that the jobs and the economic engine still is maintained. Um, and if done correctly, CCUS can do that. Uh, we can reduce air emissions, we can create new jobs, it can be a motor of new economic development. And that's why our foundation is interested in this topic. Uh, and that's why we hope Texas can continue its leadership on energy and, and continue to do more on carbon capture utilization and storage. So I, I've been asked to kind of set the stage and do a high level, level setting of, of what is CCUS, why now, uh, and, and why Texas. And uh, let's just start with a, a, a quick acronym check. CCUS, Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage. Uh, that diagram up there gives you just kind of a quick overview of what it is. You've got a large point source of emissions, whether it's a power plant, a cement factory, a steel plant, a refinery, petrochemical, that emits a pretty, pretty, pretty pure stream of carbon dioxide. There's equipment on that smokestack uh, that the emissions pass through and it captures the CO2, and then you can either inject it underground for storage or use it uh, for uh, enhanced oil recovery, which is the U in utilization and CCUS, or use it potentially as a feedstock for, industrial pro for other industrial processes. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of what CCUS is. So on the next slide, we're going to kind of talk about the moment that CCUS is having. Uh, these are just some headlines that I pulled over the last couple of months. Um, and I, I would argue that when Exxon and Elon and when Joe Biden and Dan Crenshaw agree something is important, then there's probably some momentum behind it. And it's not only just the bipartisan support uh, that we see with carbon capture, utilization, and storage, uh, but there's also interest across broad sectors of the economy. Uh, when United Airlines is getting involved in projects to offset their emissions, there's something there about what's going on with carbon capture uh, utilization and storage. Uh, so, so the next slide, why, why now? Uh, this is a, a, a graph from the International Energy Agency's report uh, about carbon capture utilization and storage. The source is there on the bottom right. Um, and they're looking out to 2070, where they're projecting that we get to net zero energy emissions and figuring out how do we get there? And you'll see that at the bottom there in pink is CCUS. Um, and, and interesting to me is that in 2070, uh, you are getting the same amount of reductions from CCUS as you do with that kind of turquoise color uh, towards the top, the, one, the fourth color down, which is renewables. So according to the International Energy Agency, CCUS and renewables will have the same reduction potential in 2070. That's a huge tool available to us um, that is going to be really critical to meeting the climate goals. Um, and it's not just it's going to be critical, but there is analysis that shows that without carbon capture, uh, getting to, to net zero is going to be 138% more expensive. Uh, and so there, there's some cost savings to, to go about it this way, not to mention the, the economic impacts in terms of jobs, et cetera. Um, so this is a, a massive tool that is key to addressing the climate crisis, which the events of the last week show us it's already here. Um, uh -huh. And importantly, with CCUS, you also unlock two other key technologies, which I think are going to be critical to Texas. One is uh -huh. hydrogen, uh, which is creating hydrogen with a carbon capture and storage. Uh, so it has a low carbon impact, and that can be used in a variety of different industrial processes. Uh, from industrial heat, and you can also use it as a fuel source, or you can use it and turn it into ammonia and use it as a, as a fuel for things like shipping. And that's going to be, I think, important for the Texas economy, uh, as is direct air capture. So unlike uh, CCUS, where you have uh, equipment to take the carbon out of the smokestack, direct air capture are basically these giant fans that pull air through anywhere in the world, and as the air gets pulled through, you're taking the carbon out of it. So it's a less uh, pure stream of CO2, but you can do it anywhere. And there's growing momentum and engagement on this. And 
my understanding, which is limited, but uh, somewhat uh, robust, is that in order to make direct air capture to work, you need cheap power. We've got that in Texas. You need a place to put it. We've got that in Texas. It helps to have hot, dry weather. We've got that. Um, and you got to have the know-how and the infrastructure to move it around. And we've got that. Uh, so there's no reason why Texas couldn't be the, the Texas of direct air capture, but we just got to put the, the, the policies in place to make it happen. Uh, and you can't get there without robust policies on CCUS. Uh, so the next slide, we've got, um, you know, why, why Texas? Uh, so uh, these are also, uh, these two maps are from the IEA report. You can see on the map on the left, just kind of a, a heat map of where greenhouse gas emissions are across the U.S., and then kind of a, a zooming in of that heat map on Texas. And overlaid on that um, are the pipeline networks, existing pipeline networks, as well as places where you can put uh, the CO2. The kind of cross-hatched gray and white is saline storage, um, and the darker gray is uh, storage where you could use uh, enhanced oil recovery. And so kind of the, the, the moral of the story here, uh, and, and the table on the left is all the greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 in Texas, uh, and that's from the EPA inventory. And so, you know, the moral of the story here is it's not many places in the world where you've got all these things coming together. You've got the large sources of emissions, you've got places to put the CO2, whether that's in saline or for enhanced oil recovery, uh, you've got the infrastructure to gather and move it around, you've got the know-how and the workers to, to do it. Uh, and so that's why Texas has a unique opportunity to be a leader, continue its leadership on CCUS uh, globally. Uh, in fact, about half of CCUS installations in the world are in the U.S., and about half of the, those installations are in Texas. Um, and so we already have a leadership role in this. Let's make sure that continues. Uh, the next slide uh, shows an analysis uh, that, that we funded the Great Plains Institute to do uh, to look at if you were to build a big old CO2 pipeline network across the U.S., where is all that CO2 going to go? Um, and the moral of the story is a whole lot of it's going to come down to Texas. Um, and that has a huge impact in, in part, in large part, because we've got the places to put it. We've got the demand for it. Um, and so with that comes the economic development and the opportunity to, uh, to really use this as a key part of our strategy to both grow the economy and decarbonize the, the Texas economy as well. Uh, so th this is an overlooked but important piece that I think people need to be aware of, that as more CCUS gets constructed, a lot of that CO2 is going to come to Texas and be put to beneficial use or injected into our saline formations. Um, so, you know, what, what are the barriers? Uh, so we uh, funded Rice University to convene a stakeholder group of about 30 different stakeholders from the oil and gas sector, from the industrial sector, from the academic world, and from the non-governmental world uh, to come up with a policy roadmap for Texas on CCUS. Um, and they identified one gigantic hurdle, uh, which is having Texas have class six primacy and jurisdictional clarity, uh, which if you don't know what that means, let me just spend a couple of seconds. Um, right now, in order to inject CO2 underground, you need a class six well to do so. And the EPA currently has the authority to regulate those wells in Texas. Uh, but a state can seek primacy where it asks EPA to say, actually, EPA, we prefer to regulate that in state and not have you do it. Um, and so Texas has not yet done that, uh, but the policy stakeholders are recommending that we do. Uh, but then also within Texas, de depending on where your class six injection well is, uh, that well, if EPA does give Texas primacy, could be regulated either by the Railroad Commission or the TCEQ. Uh, so the stakeholders have said, first, Texas should seek primacy, and second, that there should be jurisdictional clarity as to who is the lead uh, regulatory agency within Texas, and the recommendation was that should be the Railroad Commission. Uh, so there are, there's already a bill in this legislative session, both in the Senate and the House, uh, that a, a diverse group of stakeholders ranging from Texoga to the Environmental Defense Fund are supporting to try to get that clarity and to give the authority to, for Texas to seek privacy. 
Um, there are other issues there that were, were brought up for consideration. Uh, I won't read off the list, uh, but they all kind of revolve around the fact that CCUS is expensive. Uh, 45Q is good for a lot of projects, uh, but there's still many that don't quite pencil out even with 45Q and addressing some of these considerations can lower the cost and lower the barriers to doing more CCUS in Texas. Um, so this is my last slide. I know I'm almost at time. Uh, but the moral of this slide here is that there are plenty of places out there that are full steam ahead on, on industrial decarbonization and CCUS, and they're doing this through the hub concept. Uh, there's one in the UK, there's one in Norway, there's one at the Port of Rotterdam, uh, and they're all slightly different, but they all share a common DNA of government investment in central infrastructure, whether that's a CO2 trunk line or low carbon power or something along those lines that then unlocks private sector investment. Um, and, and this is kind of another way to lower those costs. There are a lot of companies that say, well, you know, if I am going to put the, the CCUS installation onto my facility, I've got to have a place to put it. Um, and so if there can be centralized uh, action from the government that funds that infrastructure to move it forward, uh, then that's going to lower some of the costs and enable some private sector engagement that might not happen otherwise. Uh, so that's been the model that uh, key places in Europe are pursuing. Uh, you know, and I think that it's a model that could make a lot of sense in Texas uh, for all the reasons that we've outlined earlier. Uh, but I'm also a little afraid that if we wait too much longer to try to adopt that model, those other places will be far ahead of us. And not only will Texas risk losing its energy leadership, uh, but will risk losing out on the economic development that could come with being a low carbon hub. Uh, so with that, I will end my presentation and look forward to taking questions later. And thank you all for the opportunity. Yeah, and I'm, you've already got several questions, but I think what we'll do is maybe after Dr. Romanak finishes her presentation, then we'll, we'll pitch uh, those to you, both of you. So anyway, well, our next speaker, we're so happy to have her because she is quite the legend in the area of carbon capture, is Dr. Catherine Romanak. She comes to us from UT's Bureau of Economic Geology and is part of the theme that I was describing earlier, this multidisciplinary approach with everybody bringing their diverse expertise trying to, to address this particular issue. Uh, Dr. Romanak's research has focused on CO2 sequestration, again, before some of this was fashionable. She's going to discuss environmental monitoring of geological CO2 storage sites and why it's needed and how it helps ensure safety and also to assure the public and, and markets of the efficacy of CCUS processes. So uh, she's also going to describe global regulations. You heard Drew describe really the regulatory regime in Texas. And so Dr. Romanak is going to discuss global regulatory frameworks and economic monitoring approaches. Because again, there's, there are all these different uh, pressures, including, you know, it's got to be economic. So Dr. Romanak. Thank you so much, Pam. And um, yes, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk about environmental monitoring at geological CO2 storage sites next. Um, so environmental monitoring, yes, it's really important because we need to upscale CCS by two orders of magnitude by 2050. And we need to make sure that these projects can move forward um, smoothly and in a way that protects the environment. And so what I want to talk about today is I'm aware that there's a lot of different um, you know, there's, there's a variety of experience in the audience and knowledge in CCS. So what I want to do is give you an overview of environmental monitoring. But what I also want you to come away with is that there have been some very important learnings in environmental monitoring recently. And these are not necessarily yet reflected in the regulations. And so what I want to help um, you do is to understand the new paradigm in environmental monitoring and how we can apply this within the regulatory framework in a way that is cost-effective and accurate. 
And so I'm from the Gulf Coast Carbon Center at the University of Texas, where we have a lot of experience in, in C CO2, geological CO2 storage. We have over 20 years of experience. We've worked on some of the uh, largest projects in the world. And um, that has to do with storage. So the big picture, you know, stakeholders have a really hard time understanding how you put carbon dioxide deep in the earth. But it's really the environment that they care about because it's where they live, it's what they see, it's what they know. And so really I see environmental monitoring as the interface between the project and the public. And being in environmental monitoring, I get this question all the time. Is it safe? Will it leak? And what happens if it leaks? And, and so my answer to that is geologic CO2 storage is safe by design. We know the places, the right places to put CO2. We have to do site characterization. We have to get the project permitted. This requires a high level of assurance. And then we do risk assessment to, uh, with modeling to identify the potential unwanted outcomes. And then we design the project to minimize risk. And then we monitor it, and we monitor it in the deep subsurface to ensure that the CO2 plume is behaving the way we predicted. And then we monitor it in the shallow subsurface, um, which is the shallow groundwater, the Vado zone, and the biosphere. So what I'm going to be talking about today is the Vado zone, which is basically the soils just below the ground surface. But please be aware that all of the concepts that I talk about today can be applied in groundwater, they can be applied in surface water, they can be applied in the marine environment. So why do we do environmental monitoring? Well, it's a question that people are really asking because CO2 storage is safe by design, right? So why do we need, if we don't expect leakage, why do we need to monitor the environment? Well, one of the reasons is that we want to directly observe the environmental resources that we want to protect. We want the assurance that they're being protected. And very simply, regulation and permitting uh, requirements require that we monitor the environment. In case of leakage, we have to be able to quantify and account for the emissions that have been lost. And then we may, in, in, in fact, in the future, want to monitor our remediation efforts if there's any environmental damage. And one reason that I think many people are not aware of, and I think it may even be one of the prime reasons, is we need fast and targeted response to public concerns. So the, just the general overall components of near-surface monitoring, we need to first locate any anomalies that could signify leakage, but then we need to attribute the source of those anomalies. Do they come from the project or do they come from some natural phenomenon? Then we want to quantify the emissions if we have leakage. We also want to confirm environmental integrity, and again, as I said, and, and I'll talk more about this, engage and assure stakeholders. So it's really interesting. When you're monitoring in the deep reservoir, it's a very quiet environment, and the variability that we see in the reservoir is a function of the variability of the injection. It comes from the CO2 injection. But as we move up into the near surface, the variability is a function of the variability of the environment. And it's very difficult to, um, to understand what is leakage and what is just natural variability. And this is because CO2 is naturally everywhere. And the dominant source is biological respiration of soil microbes and plant roots. And it's reactive and it's dynamic over space and time. And so it's difficult to even determine what is anomalous. And so we have gone through a lot of great science trying to find leakage. And we have all kinds of ways that we can do routine monitoring to find leakage. But what I would say to you is what are we actually looking for? Well, really what we're looking for is just areas of high CO2 and areas of low CO2. And if you look on the left, you see um, the soil 
flux of CO2 in soils over the Weyburn Mydell CO2 storage project. And it's just natural CO2. Natural CO2, and th that's just naturally occurring in situ CO2. But when you look at the right, this is a volcanic area in Laterra. And basically, volcanic areas are very good analogs to CCS leakage because the CO2 is coming from depth and it's coming up to the surface. So, but when you look at these two pictures, you see they look very similar. You just have areas of high CO2 and areas of low CO2. And so how do we actually determine what is anomalous? Well, the way we've been doing it is you measure the baseline CO2 concentrations for one year before the project starts to document the actual normal ranges of CO2 at the project site. And then through the, throughout the project, you monitor the CO2. And if it ever gets higher than the normal background range, range then you have leakage. But there is, we're not actually finding leakage, we're finding anomalous CO2. And so we have to ask the question, did the storage project cause the anomaly or was it just natural variation? And so attribution is a missing step in the regulations. So I collaborated with Tim Dixon of IEA GHG, and we looked at eight global regulations, and we have actually just recently um, doing a paper that will come out um, for the GHGT conference where we've added the California low carbon fuel standard analysis. But basically what we see here is, first of all, note that the main objectives of the global regulations are all fit objectives that have to do with monitoring at the surface, either green greenhouse gas accounting or protection of the environment. Um, but what we see is that most of these global regulations require that we go out and look for leaks. And they also recommend that we use baseline or background measurements as our way of finding leaks. But when we look at the regulations, attribution is a missing step. It's not something that's brought into the consciousness of the people doing the projects or even the regulators. So it's a, a very important step. It's a missing step. And in fact, without that step, if you look at the way the regulations are written, they basically say you go out and you look for an anomaly, you use baseline measurements to find that anomaly, and then you start quantifying it. But we don't want to quantify something unless it's a leak. So it's really important to use good attribution. But what the, we have recently found is that baselines in short soils are shifting upwards because of climate change. Here's a paper in Nature that shows that the flux of CO2 from soils is rising year on year, and it's attributed to global climate change. We also see that baselines in groundwater are shifting upward. And so we, so we have this problem with baselines that if we use baselines, then we're going to get false positives time and time again throughout the project. And false positives um, are going to shut down projects that are operating correctly, and we need to meet our climate targets, and so we, we, we don't want this to happen. And like I said, because CO2 storage is safe by design, the risk of false positives is actually greater than the risk of leakage. And right when we came out with this, this thinking, it actually happened. At the Tamakamai project, it's an offshore demonstration project in Hokkaido, Japan, and they did everything right. They did everything according to the regulations. They derived their leakage thresholds based on a year of baseline, and it only took seven months of routine monitoring, one month of routine monitoring, 7,000 tons. They found a CO2 concentration that was above the threshold, and the project was shut down for almost a year while they tried to work out what was happening. And so we really can't let this happen to projects that are operating correctly. Next. So shifting baselines can cause false positives and project shutdowns. So when we're actively looking for leakage, we're going to find a lot of anomalies, and then we're going to have to attribute the source. And we see now that baseline methods are not effective. So how will we adequately assure environmental protection? 
Well, we can take another lesson from the Kerr leakage allegation. In 2011, landowners living near a project perceived environmental change in their land and they want they blame the project. And at that time, protocols for responding to stakeholders' concerns were not in place. And so time and time again, they felt like their um, questions were not being answered. And so they finally, in desperation, hired their own consultant, who of course wrongly attributed uh, these phenomena to leakage. That created a negative media storm that went around the world, and we were one of the teams that was called out to actually, you know, attribute this, this anomaly to see is it really leakage or not, and it was not leakage. But by that time, the damage had been done. So what we really want to do is we want to avoid this. We need protocols. We need accurate protocols in place before a project begins so that we can, um, so that we can address stakeholders' concerns. So, like I said, I see as environmental change happens because of climate change and when CCS is fully deployed, I believe that environmental monitoring for responding to stakeholders' concerns may be our main important activity. And so at the University of Texas at Austin Bureau of Economic Geology, we've been very aware of this. And so we have developed a different method that uses gas relationships to understand the processes that are causing the gases to be what they are. You do, they're not based on baseline or background. You only need a one-time characterization. And the method can be applied anywhere, anytime. And it's very user friendly. Um, if you look at that line that says respiration, it's so easy. The results are instantaneous. Anything to the left of that line or on that line is natural. If you see anything go to the right of that line, then it could signify leakage. So it's something that even stakeholders could do in their backyards if necessary. So it's instant and it's, um, and it's accurate and it's fast, which is what we need. So I'm going to end by going back to my original um, uh, pictures here. At the Weyburn site, those CO2 blotches were actually natural. And here below that is the actual process-based data that we used at the Kerr site. And you can see it's left of the respiration line. It is natural. There's no leakage occurring. But if you go over to Latera, and these are the data that we actually used at the ZERT controlled release site to show that indeed a leakage signal will manifest to the right of that respiration line. So, so basically, I'm not going to go through these summaries and recommendations, but just to say again that we have had some really good experience in CCS, um, and, and we have learned some things that actually completely change our approach to environmental monitoring, but that is not yet reflected in the regulations. And so what we need to be doing is we need to be, first of all, updating these regulations, but secondly, while the regulations stand as they are, we want to make sure that we take the new paradigm of environmental monitoring and help it to fit within the regulatory framework. So that's it for me, and thank you so much for your time. That was wonderful. I mean, you raised a lot of issues that I suspect even the most sophisticated CCUS folks hadn't thought about. So we have a number of questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, I'm ask a few live and then ask the speakers to address the others you know in writing because you can type in an answer so so we have so many questions that i just don't want to take all of the time but there are some here that are fascinating a lot of them are duplicates and so uh uh here's one for you dr romanak who starts uh in addition to the shallow monitoring how about underground safety education campaigns for the public so, so as to emphasize on proven ability of reservoirs to seal or store for millions of years. I think that's great. I think I think it's needed. I mean, all kinds of outreach are needed, and and you're correct to think that you know there is a lot of 
technical expertise that we have that can help us show even, even what we are monitoring in the deep zones are showing us that the operation is going safely. So absolutely, yes. First of all, any kind of education we can do is important. And yes, the deep subsurface definitely has a role to play in that. Okay. And then Drew, here, uh, I'm gonna conflate two questions. <laughs> Who do you think would be Texas's main competitors in CCUS and the economic benefits that may come from that? And then sort of related to that is, is the Texas program better than the California program? Yeah, um, but before I answer that, I just want to give, give a hearty endorsement uh, of Dr. Romanak's presentation. W without the safeguards and the assurances to the public that when you stick the CO2 underground, it stays there and it's safe, all, all of this falls apart. Mm -hmm. And so that the monitoring stuff and, and the public trust and the trust of, of regulators and the environmental community and, and those that are pushing for a decarbonized world rests on this exact issue that Dr. Romanak put forward. And so I, I just think it's often something that people don't think about but, it, but it's absolutely critical. Um, and the transparency and the need to do it, it, it is, is just really, really fundamental. Um, so Pam, to, to your question, um, I, I think the, the competitors to this are, are really, it's the global economy. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, Texas and, and, and the Houston area in particular, I think it's really at an inflection point right now. We, we can continue to, to stick our heads in the sand and, and pretend like the world isn't on a path towards decarbonization and become the Detroit uh, of the next century. Um, or we can look out ahead of the curve and say, okay, we need to, to be proactive here and the world is decarbonizing and let's make sure that we are part of that. And not only just part of that, let's make sure we're leading the parade. And so, you know, in Europe, they're doing that, uh, and, and key parts of Asia, they're doing that, and Australia, they're doing it. And if we continue to pretend like we don't need to do it, then the, the parade will have passed us by and we'll find ourselves in a not particularly good position economically. Uh, so so that, that's one of the things that, that keeps me up at night, is we, we, can, we can control our own destiny, but the window for uh, that is, is rapidly closed. Um, in terms of Texas versus California, um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot more interest um, from the policymakers in California about this, uh, but there's a, a lot more ability to do it here in Texas. Um, now, you know, it's interesting that the, the California low carbon fuel standard, what Dr. Romanat mentioned in her presentation, it's actually driving a, a lot of direct air capture projects, including here in Texas. Um, so in essence, California policies are incentivizing Texas innovation, mm -hmm. um, which makes a lot of people, including me, happy. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, I think there, it's not right to think of this as a California versus Texas, uh, but how can the two policies and frameworks in those two states drive change on this topic? Along those lines, several questions having to do with why is Texas primacy important to the success of CCUS? And, and then related to that, what, what is the timing and, and the exact status? You talked about legislation, but you know, I think people are curious about why does Texas, rather than the federal government or some other entity, need to have primacy? Yeah, it, it's, it's a complicated question. Um, and so any answer is going to be a little bit re reductive there. But, but I think at its essence, um, you know, I, I, my first job out of grad school was at the Environmental Protection Agency. I, I'm a proud alum of the EPA. I think they do great work. But I would argue that nobody knows uh, the Texas oil and gas industry like the Railroad Commission. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think they, they have the monitoring and the ability and with folks at, at BEG um, to really make sure that, that CO2 that goes underground stays underground. And, and I, I think there, there is a, um, there, there's a, a better baseline of technical knowledge on this topic there. Um, and so I think that that's a key part of it that, that often gets overlooked. Um, but, but then also it, it, it tends to be quicker. 
And so in a world in which we uh, want to incentivize CCUS as a tool to decarbonize, uh, making sure that the permits and the permit review is robust, where I'm not using quicker here as, a, as, a, as an alias for we, we can just rubber stamp it, but making sure there's still robust review, but doing so more quickly, I, I think can be done with the Railroad Commission versus the EPA. Um, in order for the EPA to give primacy to Texas, um, that, that can take a couple of years, and, and a couple of states are already ahead of us uh, in terms of requesting primacy for Class 6 wells. Um, and, and then just to circle back, and there was another question in there earlier about Class 2 wells. Um, so I, I'm not a lawyer. I haven't played a lawyer on TV. You should not take legal advice from me, and if you do, you get uh, your, your mental health examined. Um, but my, <laughs> my understanding is, is that... Um, Class two wells are essentially the wells that do enhanced oil recovery, where Texas already does have primacy, and it and it and it's worked, um, and it's worked well, uh, and so there's there's a history of um, primacy and and the railroad commission regulating that, and so the class six would be for the saline wells, and, and so we would just be doing what's already been done, but for the class two side. Dr. Romanek, do you have anything to add? Because I've got two questions for you. So. No, that's fine. No, that was Drew did a great job answering that. Uh, uh, there is a lot of curiosity uh, in the questions about the state of the insurance market to cover the risk of leaks in geologic storage. And, and, and sort of related to that, who owns the liability if something goes wrong? Yeah, so um, liability is something that I think um, maybe some of the other panelists can answer better than I can, but I do know that it's a it's, it's a very big um, point of discussion right now, and I, I don't think it's solved. And as far as the um, li as far as the insurance goes, <clears throat> what I can tell you is that what most of the regulations do is they set aside a certain amount of of money in case there's environmental damages. So, so they have kind of a holding tank of, of funds um, that they, they, bring, they bring out at the beginning of a project in case there's environmental damage. So that, that's, my, that's my knowledge on that. I don't know if Drew has more that he wants to say about that. <clears throat> and, and, and that's an area where the lawyers can probably. Yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway, so when you talk about liability and everybody starts getting excited, so anyway. Uh, so I think those are those are all the questions that I'll ask you to respond to orally. But if you would type any answers to, in response, oh, sure. I want our audience to really feel like their specific questions got addressed, and and send us any suggestions about you know things that you want to have us cover at the tail end. Because if we have a little bit of time, we'll we'll sort of expand uh, the the provocative, frisky debate among the panelists. So now I'm going to turn it over to JJ. Okay. Um, I want to introduce Tony Catone. He's uh, Senior Director, Strategy and Sustainability at Oxy Low Carbon Ventures. Um, Oxy, as we know, um, or as we'll learn, has been one of the leaders in the efforts surrounding CCUS and getting CCUS to scale. Um, on an annual basis, Oxy uses approximately 20 million metric tons. With CO2 and its operations, and Oxy CEO, CEO has recently described Oxy as the world's largest carbon management company. Tony will be discussing some of the efforts being made with CCUS technology in the upstream sector, as well as how Oxy views the role of CCUS in the upstream industry and in the energy economy as we transition to a net zero energy marketplace. Tony? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, JJ, for that, that introduction. Uh, like JJ said, I, I lead strategy and finance for Oxy Low Carbon Ventures. Um, and I'm really here today to talk a little bit about sort of my personal journey, but also Oxy's journey to becoming a carbon management uh, company and, and how that's really differentiated, I would say, within the carbon capture uh, utilization sequestration space. And, and JJ, oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, so what you see here, obviously, is a rendering of, of a direct air capture a facility that, that we plan on having online by, by 2025. Uh, this will be the largest commercial scale direct air capture facility um, uh, deployed here in Texas in the mm -hmm. Permian Basin. This is something that we're extremely proud of. And it's really a journey that, that started uh, practically decades ago. Um, but, but mine really started um, uh, re really going back all, all, all the way to early in my career. Um, I started out my career on Wall Street 
um, and, and, and quickly was really thrown into the oil and gas industry. Um, and, and really what I uh, always admired uh, about the industry was, was its abilities to solve extremely complex problems. Um, so I was in New York City, uh, sitting on Wall Street and, and learning that the oil and gas industry was able to drill 10,000 feet down, turn 90 degrees to the right, and, and drill another 10,000 feet laterally. I thought that was incredible innovation, talent in, in this industry. And so that's why I'm really excited about, about being here, about uh, being in this seat to be able to uh, help influence um, the, the entire oil and gas industry uh, to transition really from traditional uh, oil, oil and gas players uh, to, to carbon management players. So what is carbon management? What is carbon management to, to Oxy? I've actually put uh, a definition um, since this is a relatively new term, I would say, but it really gets down to the responsible management of, of carbon-based energy um, from the extraction all the way to that utilization. So thinking through the supply chain all the way to the combustion um, of, of that hydrocarbon and integrating carbon recycling and disposal to be able to eliminate that, that carbon waste. So really taking responsibility across the value chain of the energy system. A really easy way to think about this is uh, sort of like the waste management industry, right? So collecting garbage and disposing of it. Uh, in a lot of ways, we think of carbon uh, in the same way as garbage or as, as waste. And so for Oxy, we have this very unique position, like JJ said, in the Permian Basin. We're already sequestering 20 million tons of CO2 every year. That's through our enhanced oil recovery business. And what we have here is an opportunity to effectively plug in anthropogenic and atmospheric CO2. So in plugging in atmospheric CO2, you're uh, sequestering and abating that carbon into the reservoir. And at the same time, you're producing additional energy. Uh, we call this net zero oil, net zero hydrocarbons, because the carbon that is from the scope one through three emissions of that barrel of oil is abated through the production of that oil. So this is a really interesting uh, value proposition, we think, um, for the industry and for decarbonization at large. So, so that's one side of the business, uh, of your waste management business. You have carbon recycling, just like a, a recycling business. On the other side of the business, you have a landfill, right? So we've been talking about dedicated sequestration a little bit uh, already today, but literally capturing anthrop anthropogenic CO2, atmospheric CO2, and sequestering that into dedicated sequestration saline formation. So Oxy is really interested in both sides of these business businesses. It's going to be customer driven. And, and I'll get, get to that on the next slide here, maybe JJ. So th th this is how, how we, we see the transportation uh, sector really evolving, right? And you can read sort of any climate change book out there um, and uh, it, in its own way, it will describe the transportation sector like this, where you have mileage and mass like presented on this graph. And so we're not, when you're not going very far and you're not carrying a lot of mass, uh, you're talking about light duty vehicles. Um, we, we expect there to be EV penetration there. We, we want there to be EV penetration there. It's good for the environment. It's good for reducing emissions. And so we're full on preparing for that, right? Um, I drive an EV. What, what I know about it is that the energy density of that battery is 250 watt hours per kilogram. In order to go the, the miles and the mass needed by aviation, by marine, by rail, you need about 12,000 watt hours per kilogram. That, that is a 50 times scale up. Um, what, what I'll say in, in some ways, in, in the context of cl climate change, um, in, in certain industries that have long capital cycles, um, the, the, the die can almost be cast, right? So if, if you're uh, an airline, you've recently bought a um, uh, new airline, that's going to be part of your business for 30 years, right? In the context of climate change, we need to achieve net zero really by 2050, right? And so what are the alternatives instead of writing off your, your new aircraft or, 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 or your new ship? Right, so these are low carbon fuels, right? And from Oxy's perspective, the way you get to a low carbon aviation fuel uh, is net zero oil, right? Directly capturing CO2 out of the atmosphere, 
uh, sequestering that into an oil reservoir and producing uh, additional net zero oil and providing that to these industries uh, that are going to have a harder time decarbonizing um, because EVs uh, have a harder time penetrating into those types of markets. I'll go on to the next slide, JJ. This is it really in, in practice, right? Uh, as I described it, we're capturing CO2 from the atmosphere with uh, the, the, the first plan outlined by 2025. 20, uh, that will be powered by zero emission energy, right? Uh, injecting that CO2 into a, a oil reservoir in, in the Permian Basin and producing additional energy that is net zero, supplying that to our partners um, in the aviation, marine, and, and trucking industry. So we think that this is a, a really interesting solution, and it's really going to help with decarbonization efforts in these hard to decarbonize industries. So uh, on my final slide here, you know, I, I, I think what's really interesting about this is, um, you know, I, I think CCUS is really the reason to exist um, for oil and gas companies in the context of climate change. Um, there's really no other industry out there that knows how to capture gas, um, uh, put that into a supercritical phase, transport that on, on a pipeline uh, to uh, drilling a well 10,000 feet down into a geologic reservoir, uh, do the subsurface characterization around that reservoir to ensure that it's going to be there over geologic time. There's no other industry out there and this is, really should be the rallying cry, I think, for the entire oil and gas industry to convert really from traditional oil and gas players um, to CO2 removal and carbon management companies. Uh, I'll just say that the opportunity is quite large, and that's what's really just being presented um, here, here on the slide, is that um, there, there's massive amounts of CO2 that needs to be captured at point sources, uh, that needs to be captured from the atmosphere, uh, in order to, to reach the, the climate objectives that uh, society needs to set and it needs to stick with over the next several decades. That's it for me, JJ. Okay, Tony, that's great. Um, I think we've got one question that came in on uh, permitting for the direct air capture facility. Um, it, it, yeah, I guess construction on it is to begin in 2022 um, in the Permian. You know, do, are, do you have all those permits? Um, what type of permits are those, ranging from local, county, uh, level ones to state and federal? Yeah, uh, look, so that's uh, getting a little beyond my, my, my particular knowledge, heading sort of strategy and, and finance for, for the group. Um, I'll say that um, we are working through that process. Construction is to uh, begin in, in the next year. Um, there, there are things like air permitting that, you know, are, are in process that, that I am aware of. Um, but from an environmental impact per perspective, you can sort of think of this as, as, as a chemical plant. Um, there's a base chemical um, KOH that's used to, to absorb the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, and and there, there aren't massive uh, environmental impacts um, due to this um, uh, direct air capture facility. So um, could certainly follow up with uh, more sort of direct uh, answer to those uh, by following up with some of my team members. Okay, very good, very good. Um, you know, another question just came in, uh, you know, why do you direct air capture when there's so many other CO2 capture opportunities from industry? Yeah, so uh, direct air capture is not the only answer, right? Um, we should be capturing from, from point source emitters as well. Um, I'll say that if, you know, one reason, right, is that if you look at any climate scenario, um, there is going to be an overshoot of CO2 stock in the atmosphere. So your parts per million uh, will be at, at a level that is too high in terms of warming the planet. And so you will literally have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, that, that is one of the reasons why we need to focus on carbon removal technologies. It, it is for that very reason. Um, you know, the, I, I actually see um, the direct air capture uh, technologies in terms of coming down uh, uh, the cost curve uh, rather rapidly. Um, you can sort of think of direct air capture very much like the wind and solar um, industry, um, where there's incentives in place 
and you don't have feedstock risk, right? So with wind and solar, you knew statistically that the wind was gonna blow and the sun was gonna shine. For direct air capture, there's enough feedstock because it's air, right? Um, and, and so what does that mean is that you can really do rapid deployment of this technology. Whenever you're doing a point source emission um, uh, project, um, what, what's going to happen is you're effectively daisy chaining multiple um, parties within a, a value chain from the emitter to the capture facility to a pipeline all the way to the sequesterer. It can be very difficult to, to coordinate those efforts, and you're always going to have market risk inherent in that emitter. Right, so that emitter is going to have to sign up for minimum volume commitments to be able to finance everything beyond that. Right, and so you're asking that emitter uh, to reduce their operational flexibility, um, and so they have to be certain that that their market is going to maintain a certain amount of capacity uh, in order to to make those projects happen. And so I think what's going to happen over time is the cost of capital for those projects for those point source emission projects. Uh, it's going to be more expensive because you're inherently always going to be discounting that market risk. Uh, with direct air capture, you're not you're going to have a lower cost of capital because you're not going to have that feedstock market risk in there. Um, and so costs are going to come down for direct air capture because you're deploying it rapidly and multiple times and, and improving the technology and pr improving the deployment of that technology. Um, and then beyond that, you're going to have a lower cost of capital. So I, uh, to, to conclude that, I actually see, um, I think what will be referred to as carbon as a service, where uh, instead of um, you know, uh, take, capturing CO2 off the back end of a particular uh, emitters, or uh, I, I think emitters will probably call up uh, carbon as a service and, and order carbon removal. You know, related question that came in, <clears throat> do you see 45 Q sufficient for direct air capture growth? Uh, 45 Q is certainly supportive of, of direct air capture. Um, like we've been talking, direct air capture is going to be at the high end of the cost curve today, right? Um, you know, not all carbon emissions are created equal in terms of the purity uh, of them and the concentration of them for direct air capture. You're talking about capturing from the atmosphere, which is 415 parts per million, 0.04% uh, concentration. And so what you're having to do is move massive amounts of air, and that requires electricity, which, which adds to the cost. Um, now, what I try to show in my presentation, right, is that, you know, not all forms of carbon emissions are created equal. I think a really good example of this, uh, and, and it's a microcosm of, I think, is what is to be is the California market and their carbon systems there. So when you think about California, they have a cap and trade program where they're reducing emissions in industrial electric generation, those sorts of things. Those things are, that, that, that system is about $20 per metric ton in terms of cost. If you look at their transportation sector where they're reducing emissions there, it's the low carbon fuel standard program there. You're talking about small emitters all over the place, moving cars around California. Those carbon credit prices are at $200 per metric ton. Right. So what you really have to do to make this work is think about the final product, right? CCUS is an industry, but what product are we creating for what industry and what problem does that solve? Right. And so direct air capture is a solution for hard to decarbonize industries like aviation and marine um, that are uh, you know, emitting all over the, the, the planet effectively um, and EVs aren't penetrating. And uh, it's easier to capture the emissions from the atmosphere and sequester that um, here in the Permian Basin. So I, I think that 45Q definitely is supportive of it, um, but you need regulatory frameworks uh, that basically level the playing field um, in places like California for the LCFS program, direct air capture generates a credit there. Um, uh, the Corsia program for aviation is gonna begin uh, regulating carbon emissions for uh, international aviation. Um, and so that's another market where we see direct air capture uh, re really being supported by, by that regulatory program. We'll switch gears just a little bit, um, kind of broaden out a little bit. You know, do, do you think CO2 EOR has the opportunity to change expiration in the U.S.? Or will this continue to be just another sidelight to a to a robust, different, very uh, broad 
uh, types of exploration that, that we're currently used to. Uh, is the question exploration, JJ, or? Ex yes, exploration in the U.S. Look, I, I think that um, the, the reason why we're starting with, with EOR is for the reason that we have 20 million tons of CO2 abatement capacity every year, right? Now, our infrastructure in the Permian has been built over decades, starting in the 70s, right? Um, and, and so I, I'm uncertain whether um, you know, th that trend continues to uh, build, continue building EOR infrastructure and exploration for EOR. I, I hope it does, but that will be customer driven, right? That will be demand driven by aviation marine that see the value proposition of that net zero oil. But really where, where Oxy is positioning, positioning itself is for the landfill side of the business to become as large as, as the EOR business, if not larger, over time. And so we do see dedicated sequestration um, having a value proposition with those industries as well. Just a couple other questions coming in here. Um, you know, we, we, you and I talked about this the other day a little bit, I, I, you know, and I find it pretty fascinating just the, you know, the form or the possible formation of a, you know, carbon, a market for carbon neutral barrel of oil. You know, just curious yeah. your thoughts on the timing of that, you know, verification for how a barrel is, is shown as being carbon neutral. There's been some yeah. discussion about that and then, you know, maybe trading markets at some point down the road. Yeah, so uh, we, we recently worked on, on a deal with a refiner in, in India uh, on this very topic. Um, and you know, the, the way we structured this transaction um, what was to create a carbon neutral barrel of oil. Um, and, and we defined that in, in this release. And what does that mean? Um, it, it, it means that you are offsetting the emissions uh, from the combustion of, uh, from scope one through three emissions of that barrel of oil, but you're using offsets, right? And offsets from renewable energy projects, from forest, uh, forestation projects, that, that's what we've defined as a carbon neutral barrel of oil. Now, what, what we also are talking about is the net zero barrel of oil, right? Which we think is differentiated um, because it inherently changes the supply chain, changes the production uh, of that barrel of oil um, and, and you're abating uh, carbon th through the production uh, uh, of that oil. Um, and so we certainly do see um, that, you know, with this transaction that we did, um, that there is a lot of interest um, from the market in terms of carbon neutral oil, uh, net zero oil, and, and even blending these two together uh, into a structured product um, where you could possibly see a, a spot market for this here uh, relatively soon. Uh, we're working on bilateral agreements, but I think that um, there could be a spot market relatively soon and then possibly even a futures curve um, in, in this sort of market where, uh, like I was saying, in terms of aviation and marine, um, there could be demand um, from, from those sorts of industries where they, they really require um, sort of going out longer term and having a, a futures market associated with it. So we're investing in that. We're investing in the exchanges that, that want to do that. We've made venture type investments into those commodity exchanges that are um, really tying the environmental attributes um, to the commodities and tra trading those things. So uh, we're working on that. We're working on um, really the, the, the tracking of carbon through supply chains as well and the digital solutions that can enable that all the way from well down to picking up a bottle in the supermarket and having an RFID tag on there uh, that says, what's the provenance of that product? Where did it come from? Where was it transported? What's the carbon intensity of, of those legs of the trip? And being able to hold up your phone and, and see that in the product and differentiating products that way. Yeah, no, to me, that's, that's fascinating, um, you know, and especially that timing. Um, you know, that timing is, is, uh, is aggressive. Um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully these kind of things happen because I think it'll help support all of this. Um, let me switch gears just a little bit again, um, you know, kind of broaden out a little bit in Oxy versus, uh, some of its peer companies, you know, a lot of the, um, oil and gas producers to curb their carbon footprint are investing, 
you know, in our focusing on other parts of what I call the energy spectrum, kind of outside of oil and gas, it seems like Oxy views it a little differently um, and wants to invest more in its oil and gas properties. Question that came in, um, you know, kind of similar to that, we talked about that is, is what are the opportunities for those other EMPs um, to move in the direction of oxy low carbon ventures. Um, you know, you see a lot of a lot of stuff in the press lately. Um, you know, and the question is, it's a nice yeah. is it a nice thing to do uh, at the moment, or is there significant profits to be had? Good, good, good question. Uh, I, I can answer this in a couple of different ways, and uh, I, I would I would just start that um, you know. B businesses are, are faced with this challenge all the time. Um, you know, they're faced with cannibalizing an old product for a new product, right? It's not unlike Apple deciding to really move forward with the iPhone, uh, understanding the potential there um, at the detriment of, of the iPod, right? And so I see certain strategies that are doing that, right? That are cannibalizing their core oil and gas business um, for, other diversified approaches um, that, you know, they don't necessarily have those core capabilities, right? What's unique about Oxy, right, is that this is certainly a plug and play opportunity. Um, from a human resources perspective, this is the best story ever, right? From an internal perspective, it says to everyone working at Oxy that we're gonna need production engineers, we're gonna need reservoir engineers, uh, we need your skill set to transition to this carbon management company. Um, and uh, effectively, that Oxy is going to be the last barrel of oil produced because the last barrel of oil produced will be done through abating CO2, right? It just has to happen that way. Um, and, and so what, what can other oil and gas companies do? Um, look, they have the skill set. They have the capabilities um, to, to, to do this. Um, this is about a business strategy, right? Uh, the low carbon fuel markets th that I showed you there uh, in aviation and marine, th these are markets that are going to be growing faster than, than the oil markets, right? They're, they're growing from a smaller base, but they'll be growing at a faster rate in the coming decades. And they'll effectively be you know, an insatiable demand uh, for these low carbon fuels. And so I, I just see this as a massive opportunity really for for the oil and gas industry um to, to have this reason to exist um to, to really be part of the solution for climate change we've got time for one more question um just kind of weaving in a, another aspect of oxy kind of into the picture just you know um as an add-on to that last question you know discuss oxy kim you know the mm -hmm. refining opportunities created by having more anthropogenic uh, CO2 available for refiners. Um, you know, I think Oxy CEO um, recently said that Oxy's CCUS efforts complements Oxy's chem business very well. You know, can you elaborate on the synergies between uh, Oxy Low Carbon Ventures and Oxy Chem? Yeah, uh, for certain. Uh, a couple of things here, right? So uh, I mentioned earlier um, that, you know, one of the reasons why we invested and are, are deploying carbon engineering direct air capture technology is because this is basically a large chemical plant, right? Um, what, what's interesting about it is that the component parts of the system um, are already at industrial scale, right? And each component part, there's about four major parts of the direct air capture system. Um, Oxy and Oxychem in particular um, uses them within our operations, right? And so we basically see this as a large chemical plant, right? Uh, KOH, I think I mentioned this earlier, is the base chemical that's used in this process. Oxy is the largest or one of the largest producers of KOH in the world, right? And so not only is the supply chain for this direct air capture technology at scale, and you can pull from that supply chain, which is really important in terms of getting a technology down a technology curve. Um, but Oxy owns parts of the, the supply chain through our chemical business and can supply those raw materials, right? And so we have that skill set 
uh, to be able to deploy this technology. We've taken similar technologies from test tube all the way up to the commercial scale. Uh, the Oxy Low Carbon Ventures team, you know, th this is a, a group uh, on the leadership team that, yes, from strategy and finance, but chemical engineering background, technology background, major project background. So we got all these people together uh, to, to be able to think through all these issues and deploy these types of technologies at massive scale, right? So um, th that's really on the vein. Uh, all this that, that I just mentioned is on the vein of, of executing these projects. Now, how can OxyChem um, also participate in, in the abatement uh, of CO2 and what is the setup like uh, like that there? Well, um, whenever you're thinking, when you're thinking about climate change, right, you have to think about what is the final impact, right? So if I invest in this technology, how many gigatons of CO2 is there potential for to abate, right? And is that end product big enough, right? So, so oil certainly is, obviously, right? A lot of emissions are coming from oil. So if you can fix that problem, there's a large potential there. Uh, the base chemical ethylene that's used you know, th throughout the, the chemical space is another interesting large market that we're investing in. We're investing pretty early stage here into a bioengineering company that is running a pilot for us to really uh, bioengineer a cyano cyanobacteria to utilize CO2 and excrete out um, ethylene through a biological metabolism. Um, so that's a really interesting technology that, that we are uh, developing, deploying. Um, whenever you, you think about some of these technologies, they take longer um, to deploy. Um, they take longer to um, uh, de-risk and, and, and deploy at, at scale. And so the timeline is a bit longer here for, for OxyChem. Um, but nonetheless, there's a large market where we can be absorbing CO2 uh, from flue gas, from the atmosphere, and creating chemicals downstream. I think that um, that wraps it up on on the Q and A there. Um, thanks, Tony. Um, you can, Great to be here. Thanks, JJ. Yeah, if you can uh, stick around just for a few minutes, um, we'll have some other questions. Maybe have a Q and A session here uh, at the end. Um, we, you've got lots of questions here. So switching gears to uh, Benjamin Hurd. Benjamin. Um, is principal with Gulf Coast Sequestration. Uh, GSC has recently commenced its application process for a class six uh, permit from the EPA, which we've been talking about earlier today, making them one of the first movers to seek a class six permit. Uh, GS GCS is currently working to complete one of the world's largest sequestration and storage facilities in Louisiana. Then we'll discuss the business of sequestration, some of the opportunities for CO2 sequestration. Um, ben is, uh, is, a, is a proud alum of uh, Bracewell. Welcome, Ben. Thanks for having me, JJ. Great to be with you guys. Um, I think we'll just start off. So, you know, JJ mentioned that we have filed for a Class 6 permit uh, for what we are calling Project Minerva. Uh, the permit was originally filed in October. Uh, we've had ongoing conversations with the EPA, and we're actually in the process of making a, a substantial technical update to the permit. We'll get into the kind of project specifics here in a minute, but before we do, just wanted to, you know, kind of take a step backwards uh, on the, um, you know, just kind of what, how we see the size of the prize. Some of these materials I think are duplicative of what others have said, but if we go to the next slide, um, you know, we, I think as others have said in the past uh, in this presentation, you know, CCUS is a critical component. And without doing C a critical component to meeting any sort of net zero uh, by 2050, and without it, the any scenario, if you don't do CCS at scale, becomes twice as expensive. And so I think that, you know, in the effort to decarbonize as Tony mentioned and others have mentioned previously, um, including Drew, you know, there is a real desire to do this, but to do it in the most cost-effective way. And we certainly believe based on the research uh, and based upon the uh, capital that we've committed, as well as our goals um, to be a solution that CCS is, uh, is critical. Uh, so the next slide. 
I think that this is just really important. I mean, when you talk about a big word like sequestration, it can it can sound much more daunting than what we what we really believe that it is. Um, but it's important, we believe, to really identify, you know, the value chain and how you want to participate in the value chain. And the value chain, we believe, is quite simple. Uh, there's the capture component, uh, the transport component, and the and the storage component. As some others have mentioned previously, you know, obviously the Gulf Coast is an extremely attractive place to do it, really because you have the point source emissions. So you have a an existing brownfield infrastructure as well as greenfield projects that have been planned where you can do a significant amount of capture. We believe that a lot of those projects obviously are going to be cited in southwest Louisiana as the numbers in terms of CapEx dollars that have been spent historically as well as those that are planned to be spent over the next several years um, indicate that there's a, a, an increasing amount of, uh, of capacity expansion, which would result in additional carbon. In addition, uh, the pipeline infrastructure, including the Denbury pipeline, but also other underutilized pipelines, as well as pre-existing right-of-ways, we believe make the transport story uh, a bit more straightforward and easier. Um, and then on the storage side, which is really where GCS is focused is that they're, you know, the Gulf Coast has the benefit of being very well understood and having the right type of subsurface rock. Um, the reason that it's well understood is not only because of the academic literature, but obviously because of the extensive amount of exploration that's taken place. So you have great well control, as well as the extensive amount of 3D seismic. Um, and both of those elements are critical in order to being successful, we believe, in any sort of EPA, um, underground injection control um, permitting process. Uh, we also believe, based upon you know, the proprietary work that we've done, that there's an expansive amount of opportunity here in non-oil um, and gas uh, producing formations in the subsurface. Most of those are um, obviously saline, saline environments. Um, Tony spoke about other environments that are much more conducive to EUR. Our project, our business model though, is, uh, is totally about um, permanent sequestration in saline reservoirs as opposed to EUR. So this is what we're building, which we believe is uh, an, ex an incredibly exciting project. So just to kind of put it in, in reference, we believe that we are building a sequestration hub. It is proximate to significant industrial corridors uh, in the Gulf Coast region. There's approximately 60 million tons per annum that is produced uh, of CO2 that's produced on this map per annum. All of that is obviously not capturable economically at current incentive frameworks, be they 45Q or LCFS. But we do believe that, um, that those incentives will come either through a combination of the rising incentive frameworks or um, more broadly, uh, just efficiencies within the system that bring the cost of capture, transport, and storage um, to be more competitive economically. If you expand this map, um, you know, to include Houston and Baton Rouge, we think that the number grows from about 60 million tons per annum to well over 100 million tons. Uh, we do believe that most of the volumes that we sequester within Project Minerva, though, will come from within this kind of map, just given the, the economic characteristics and uh, really the cost of transport. In terms of our project and particular, Project Minerva will have two project sites. Each project site will have uh, two wells that will inject in total 2.7 million tons per annum over 30 years, which, um, which would result in the sequestration of 80 million tons in total. In coming up with these numbers, what we really tried to balance was uh, accessing the largest amount of available pore space um, and land that, uh, that we controlled um, so that we could maximize really, frankly, the, the size, the scope, and the scale of the, of the sink. So if you think about it as just an underground bathtub, that's really what we were primarily interested in. Um, the, the wells will not be all necessarily at the same rate, and we're currently figuring out some of the compression and other dynamics. Uh, that need to that, that need to be there, but we do think that it's an incredibly exciting project 
once completed, it would be the largest project in the United States by over a factor of three. Uh, and that would make it one of the largest projects in the world. Um, so very excited to have started the, the class six process as, as JJ mentioned in, in Q3 of last year. And uh, we're looking forward to um, our ongoing dialogue and moving towards uh, uh, wrapping up the permitting process as expeditiously as possible. Uh, so the final slide, JJ, just obviously wanted to set forth our mission statement, which is, you know, that we really, um, you know, are, we are looking to partner with industrial sources that need long-term permanent storage for the carbon that they produce. Uh, we believe that this can be done not only safely, uh, but it's a, a really low risk, um, which I think that, um, you know, has been covered in previous presentations today in terms of the risk of the escape to the environment um, and the necessary tools that need to be done in terms of in terms of monitoring. So with that, happy to take your questions or any sort of Q&A as well, JJ. Yeah, the uh, questions are still coming in here. So um, as they do, I'm going to ask you a few of, few of my questions. Um, you know, investors and stakeholders, you know, who, you know, kind of based on your experience, you know, who do you see as as being your primary uh, target, or who, who who's the primary audience, I guess, for these type of projects? Yeah, from a, I think I'll separate it into kind of two buckets. I mean, from a customer perspective, um, you know, I think customers are looking to uh, those particular customers are largely going to be industrial sources um, that are producing relatively high volumes of CO2, so volumes in the several hundred thousand tons per annum up to, you know, perhaps um, a couple million tons per annum of CO2. Most of that CO2, we believe, will be fairly high purity, just given the, dyna the dynamics around the cost associated with capturing that CO2. So we believe that we'll get relatively high purity CO2. Um, and all of that is just to say that those Really, when you talk about the purity and you talk about the volume, uh, those are just really around making the projects economic because we believe that those that are involved in capturing are not currently looking at this marketplace as one in which it's just the cost of doing business. They're hoping that the 45Q economics or other per perhaps either existing or emerging um, incentives can create uh, maybe not something that exceeds kind of their their whack rate for an internal invested project, but is at a minimum a break-even project. Um, if you think about the investor community, you know, really, I think that that breaks down into two buckets. One is folks that believe, you know, I think as Tony did a really good job um, illustrating that this is an emerging marketplace and that they want to be on the front end of that marketplace. There is another bucket that I think is kind of your more traditional uh, tax equity investor uh, that is looking at um, wanting an additional exposure to the tax credit markets and uh, 45Q in particular provides them uh, that vehicle for additional um, tax equity investment opportunity. Okay, so we got a few more questions coming in here. Um, for the transportation of CO2, will there need to be modifications to existing pipelines, new pipelines, or will existing pipeline infrastructure be sufficient? I think you mentioned the Denbury pipeline. I don't know, there, there may be others. Yeah, I'm, I'm by no means a pipeline expert uh, and I'm not an engineer, as, as you noted earlier. You know, I'm a, I'm a proud Bracewell alum, so. You did stay at Holiday Inn Express last night, right? Yeah, yeah, I did stay at Holiday Inn Express, absolutely. It was. Uh, it's my extended stay after the polar vortex. Um, the, you know, we believe based upon the work that we've done that, you know, really there, there are no, uh, you know, CO2 has been transported in pipelines. I think as, as Tony Southfit at Oxy and others have done, including Kendra Morgan for decades. Um, so it is a safe, transportable um, substance. 
And it's also, you know, other than its warming characteristics, it's, it's, it's an inert gas. So it does not have handling characteristics that make it particularly challenging. We believe that both existing infrastructure via Denbury or other lines that are underutilized that may be repurposed for CO2 could be used. Um, there will be, we believe also, obviously additional transport infrastructure that will need to be built um, in order to carry the volumes that are necessary. Whether or not on our particular project, we're doing new build or utilizing existing infrastructure, I think it's just gonna really come down to the basics as it does in most projects, which is what's the least expensive route to get from point A to point B. So point A being the, the source, and point B being our project site. And so those we think will be the determining factors, but I think that it will be a combination of both greenfield and brownfield infrastructure on the CO2 side. And, uh, you know, I guess a related kind of question came in from the University of Oslo. Um, you know, also, does that include, you know, re reusing wells? you know, other types of, you know, compression facilities, et cetera, that are, that are uh, in the field currently? Yeah, I, I think I would separate compression from wells um, for this reason. I mean, we didn't get into a lot of the details about the class six process, but, you know, it obviously is part of the underground injection control permit process. If you were drilling or, or seeking to drill and get a permit for a class six well, it cannot be, uh, it, it has to be a new well. You cannot utilize existing well bore infrastructure. So you need to have a new well. Now, it could be that you drill for a class five well and then transfer that well over. But by definition, the class five well would be a new well as well. So you're not gonna be utilizing kind of existing older well bores and effectively, you know, to use oil and gas power lands, recompleting those well bores. Um, I do not believe that that's currently something that the EPA is going to look favorably upon. Uh, so that's item number one. Item number two on the compression, absolutely. I mean, it, one of the items that is the most expensive around the storage and transport is the compression. Um, the Denbury line runs at more than 2,000 PSI. Most of these point sources are typically emitting at you know, atmospheric or relatively low PSI pressures because of how they're, how the CO2 is being captured. Natural gas processing is a little bit different um, in terms of the CO2 that's captured there. It's at a bit higher pressure, but one of the main cost elements is the amount of compression that's needed in order to get the CO2 to supercritical phase, which I believe Drew may have mentioned earlier in his presentation, but you really do wanna transport the CO2 at supercritical um, super critical typically is plus or minus, you know, depending on all the engineering characteristics around a thousand PSI. So you are going to need a, you know, a substantive amount of compression at the point source to get the CO2 to super critical to pump it through the pipeline and then downhole. Um, so th those would be, I think, the way that I would kind of think about the, the well infrastructure and then perhaps the surface infrastructure. Switching gears just a little bit again, um, you know, I think this ties into a few of the questions we've had, but this maybe synthesizes it. Seems like, you know, there's a lot of, of literature out there on sequestration, you know, the whys and wherefores, you know, but it's, it's to this extent that I've seen, it's, it's mainly academic. I mean, what, what are you guys seeing on the ground? You know, what kind of data, technological challenges have you guys had to overcome? Sure. Um, you know, I think it's a great question. I mean, I, I think one of the, I think one of the realities, particularly in the U.S., is that most, um, there is a significant amount of data that oil and gas operators and others that have been interested in the subsurface have amassed over time. Because the government is not the royalty owner, uh, by and large, most of that data has remained in the private sphere. I mean, obviously, as you move further to the West or the offshore, uh, the, you know, the, the royalty owner is the state. But because of the patchwork nature of both the state regulatory system as well as the federal overlay when you look at the offshore, 
there is a significant amount of data that has remained in private hands as a result of that kind of structure along with the with the mineral rights being owned um, in large measure by private interest. As a result, the academic um, articles have really, they have been more limited um, by that data as opposed to their ability in some of the foreign um, governments where most of that data is public and citizens can just simply go and click on um, and with the right software analyze you know, subsurface data is kind of my understanding. That may be a little overblown, but, you know, directionally, I think that that's true. As a result, I think the academic literature that BEG, LSU, um, the Illinois Geological Survey have done have been quite helpful to identify the general characteristics about what is needed to characterize a storage reservoir. And there are commercial projects, um, most notably ADM's project. However, having said all that, what the academic research has not been able to do is really pinpoint um, and identify with the kind of specificity that the EPA requires, the characteristics in the storage reservoir or the sink or the bathtub, as it were, that need to be there. So it, there is a tremendous amount of data that the EPA wants to know in order to have you prove as the project developer or any project proof that there is not going to be any communication from the CO2 to the atmosphere, either through the well bores that you drill or other artificial penetrations that are pre-existing, namely oil and gas, but other, um, other wells that have been drilled. Secondly, they don't want any communication between the CO2 and the underground sources of drinking water. So when you look at it from a, the context of what you need to have, um, if you're thinking about it in traditional oil and gas terms, you know, you need to have well control and sometimes you need to have seismic to prove up a, a concept. In this case, you not only need to have that kind of information, but you then have to take it and do an extensive amount of reservoir simulation to effectively prove the permanence of the CO2 that occupies the pore space. And then you have to do extensive monitoring over time in addition to what the doctor talked about earlier in terms of environmental attributes, you, you also have to measure various pressure differentials and you have to use seismic to measure the extent of the CO2 plume over not only your operating life, but on a default for 50 years thereafter. So the amount of data, I would say, that the federal government is requiring, and by extension, the states will, will require when they take over ownership or primacy of these permits is going to be incredibly extensive. And I think that what it means is, is that a lot of the geoscientists that have been out there, uh, you know, looking for work are, are going to potentially have gainful employment as folks are trying to understand and characterize the size and the scope of um, the storage that's needed. I would just end with this. I, there is a tremendous amount of effort that folks are spending on identifying the sources and how to capture from those sources and what the various risks are to the operating characteristics for those source producers of CO2. We have not seen the same so sort of level of um, attention placed on characterization of the storage. I would just posit that without storage, capture is effectively irrelevant because you have to have a place to put the CO2. So the characterization of these storage reservoirs and then therefore the, by extension, the work that we're doing or the academic community is doing or other private developers are doing are critical to actually seeing CCS become a reality. Okay, I think that's a Good spot to, to end um, right there, and we'll switch gears. Thank you, Ben. Stick around if you can. Um, still got lots of questions coming in. I uh, want to switch now and talk a little bit about uh, the tax side, talk about the capital side. We're going to do that together. Um, I've got Liz McGinley um, is up next. Liz is the chair of Bracewell's tax group based in New York and has 25 years of transactional tax experience. Uh, she received both her JD and LLM in taxation uh, from NYU. 
Liz has a broad transactional background in the energy industry, representing both large and strategic and financial investors. Liz focuses on project development, incorporating carbon capture, particularly in the chemicals and biofuels industry. Liz advises numerous clients on the code section 45Q credits and monetization of those credits. Liz, I'll let you uh, take it from there. Great, thanks, JJ. Thanks, JJ. So today, um, what I would like to do is take everyone through an overview of the Section 45Q credits uh, so there's an understanding of how they act as an economic incentive in transactions. And then I will hand it over to James, who will talk about how that is incorporated into raising capital for CCUS projects. So it's very important to first understand, um, next slide, please that these are credits for federal income tax purposes and they are dollar for dollar offsets to u.s federal income tax liability they are very valuable for that reason they are not merely deductions against taxable income which are then multiplied by the taxpayer's tax rate but they're actual dollar for dollar reductions off of the um, recipient's tax liability and to how are these credits calculated and why, how are they available? The credits are available based on the amount of carbon oxide that is captured and one of three things, placed in secure geological storage that we've spoken about, used as an injectant for oil or gas recovery, or thirdly, used for a permitted purpose. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just kind of a diagram to show the process for the credits. The CO2 um, exists either from an industrial source or from direct air capture, as we spoke about. It is captured, and then there are alternatives. First, it can be left in its current form and sequestered underground, that's CO2 storage, or it can be utilized. It can be utilized generally unmodified by injecting it for enhanced oil or gas recovery, or it can be converted and it can be utilized and stored long-term in a product or process. Um, those are such things as cement production um, and algae cultivation, which was mentioned earlier in the program. And you will see that the box is open there. There are many different uses and more uses coming online every day. Um, so it's an open it's an open category. This slide shows a myriad of uses that exist today for carbon carbon oxide that is captured. Not all of these may necessarily qualify for the credit, um, but there's a very complex analysis called life cycle analysis or LCA that is deployed to determine how much CO2. Uh, that is captured is utilized in stored through one of these products or processes to quantify the credits that are available. But I just wanted to use this chart as a way to make everybody aware that there are a multitude of current uses for CO2 and it's growing each day. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the amount of credits that are available. The um, amount of credits are available each year are equal to the metric tons of carbon oxide that are captured multiplied by the applicable rate. And it's available for 12 years after the facility is placed in service. So what is the applicable rate here for the 45Q credits? And the rate uh, differs depending on whether the CO2 you capture is disposed of in secure geological storage, that's that second column there, or whether it's injected for oil and gas recovery or utilized for one of the purposes I just talked about. You will see that the credit each year um, increases up to a maximum in, tw in 2026, and thereafter it's increased by an inflation factor. But uh, it's important to notice here that the maximum credit on this chart for disposal is $50 per metric ton, whereas for injection or utilization, it's $35 per metric ton. And that's typically because in the disposal scenario where you're just taking the CO2 and burying it underground, there is no revenue source associated with that. Whereas 
if you're going to use the CO2 for um, enhanced oil or gas recovery or utilization in a product or process, um, the capture of the CO2 may be paid some amount by the off-taker for that CO2. Not in all cases, but in some cases they may be paid. To give everybody a context of the magnitude of the value of these credits, if there is a project that is generating 500,000 metric tons of carbon oxide per year um, for a facility placed in service in 2026, the credits can be worth as much as $300 million um, if it's stored in secure geological storage or $210 million if it is injected or utilized. So this is really a significant um, incentive for some of these projects, as James will talk about a little bit later. So let's talk about some of the requirements in order to qualify for the credit. The um, carbon oxide must be captured at what's referred to as a qualified facility. Um, that's uh, either an industrial source where the CO2 otherwise would have been released into the atmosphere, or it can be from ambient air, um, as Tony spoke about earlier in the Oxy project, through a direct air capture facility. Um, the facility must start construction before January 1, 2026. That was recently moved out from the January 1, 2024 through the um, legislation, the, the COVID relief legislation that was enacted in the end of 2020. So that's one of the things we've been seeing recently to try to encourage utilization of these credits and encourage carbon capture um, through tax incentives. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that you need to be in service by that date. It just means that you need to start construction, which is a relatively low threshold. And um, some of you may be familiar with the start of construction concept from the wind and solar world with ITCs and PTCs. And generally speaking, um, very similar rules have been adopted um, for purposes of start of construction for 45Q. You also have to meet minimum capture requirements um, for your project, but actually the recently released final regulations under 45Q have made that a little bit easier because it allows you under certain circumstances to aggregate um, different related facilities for purposes of showing that you're um, reaching that minimum capture. And also the carbon oxide um, capture, disposal, utilization, um, or injection must occur within the United States to be eligible for this credit. So I spoke about capture at industrial facilities as one of the ways to earn the um, 45Q credit. And, you know, that is typically, you know, what you're thinking about is capturing the CO2 from a uh, power plant or perhaps a manufacturing facility. So you're capturing it at a fuel combustion source or in a manufacturing process. There were a lot of questions about the ability to claim a credit for naturally occurring CO2. And that's often CO2 that is brought up from, other, from underground um, and you know, possibly uh, for the purpose of extracting other valuable gases that may be underground with the CO2. And the final regulations that came out in January actually made this um, uh, an easier way to qualify the, for the credits. It's not treated as a naturally occurring source that's not eligible for the credits um, unless there's 90% or greater carbon oxide by vol volume in the gases being extracted. Um, and even if it is over 90% carbon oxide, um, there is still a way to qualify for the credit if in part you use that carbon oxide for um, oil and gas recovery or uh, for utilization in one of the permitted uses that we spoke about earlier. So one of the things to be cautious about, if you're interested in achieving 45Q credits um, for purposes of your carbon capture project, is, um, as, as we spoke about earlier, this risk of uh, leakage, uh, that there is recapture of the credits. If the leakage from either secure geological storage or an EOR project exceeds the amount stored or injected in the same tax year. Um, so obviously that risk of recapture is going to go up in years where you have ceased storing or injecting additional CO2 because any leakage at that point would be in excess of storage. That um, leakage test is applied separately for each project. 
And if there is recapture of the credits, um, you, uh, you recapture the credits on a LIFO basis. So from the most recent year, a credit was used going back up to three years. This recapture period ends at the earlier of three years after the last year that the credit is claimed or the monitoring ends. So if you have 12 years of credits that you're claiming and the recapture period goes out, just generally speaking, another three years, that's 15 years from when you start the project. So that does create some concern among investors that their risk of losing the, losing the credits goes out a number of years. But again, the look back period is only, is only three years. So who are the taxpayers eligible to claim the credits? And this is very important, and this goes into some of the analysis that uh, James will talk about next. The party that is eligible to claim the credits is the person that owns the carbon capture equipment and either physically or contractually ensures that it is disposed, utilized, or injected, meeting all of the requirements under 45Q um, for qualifying for that credit. So uh, that taxpayer can do that itself, or it can contract with a third party or multiple third parties for those services. Um, so often taxpayers may contract with a company like Oxy to provide CO2 offtake um, and disposal underground um, when they don't have those facilities themselves. And they're able to transfer their credits to that person that is in direct contractual privity who is providing um, those services. Uh, but the final regulations that came out last month made clear that the credits cannot be co conveyed to any subcontractors of that party, because often subcontractors are used, but only the party that is in direct contractual privity with the party that owns the carbon capture equipment. Another important way to utilize the credits is through a tax equity structure that I'll go into a little more detail on in a moment. So the tax equity model, um, some of you may be familiar with tax equity models for monetization of credits um, in the PTC or ITC space from wind and solar deals. And it's very important when the owner of the carbon capture equipment does not have use for the credit itself, um, primarily because it is not a taxpayer. Um, maybe it has generated losses for many years and it doesn't have a need uh, for tax credits to offset cash tax liability. So it's, this is a way to utilize and get value out of the credits by passing it on to investors. Fortunately, um, last year, the IRS provided some fairly detailed guidance in RevProc 2020-12, providing a safe harbor so you know when you, you are using a structure, uh, a partnership structure, that allows you to properly allocate these credits out to investors. And the prime rule here is that tax credits generally must be allocated to the partners in accordance with their interest in the partnership at the time the credits arise. So in proportion to their share of profits or losses in the partnership, you can't deviate from their economic interest in the partnership generally. There were questions that arose as to whether the tax equity model that people were familiar with from wind and solar could be utilized in um, carbon capture and storage, which is generally not a revenue generator, um, but, but it is um, widely believed that, that that is possible and it will be a structure that's used. So I'll just touch on a few of the elements for qualifying for the safe harbor here for purposes of the 45Q credits. Um, the investor must maintain a minimum interest of 5% of its largest interest in the partnership. That investor must have a bona fide equity interest. Um, it, it must be, its returns must be based on the performance of the partnership. It can't be fixed like a debt return. Um, there can't be guarantees as to its economic or credit return. Um, they also have to make an unconditional investment upfront of 20% of their total investment. Um, but there is a limited pay-go feature that's uh, permitted, which some of you may be familiar with, again, from the wind and solar structures. But what's very important in the safe harbor guidance is that there can't be structures put in place as part of the tax equity arrangement that effectively guarantee credits or the cash equivalent to the investor. Um, but there are things that you can do indirectly to provide more assurance that the 45Q credits will be available. 
such as having lo long-term arm's length contracts um, for carbon oxide purchase or offtake agreements. And you also can contract with third-party insurers, um, which are coming into the market now uh, to provide a backstop in the event that there's either leakage and recapture or the credits or some shortfall in the, um, in the value chain of those involved in the process of capturing and, secu and securely storing or utilizing the CO2. You can have a call option um, for the interest in the carbon capture equipment and the investor can have a put right that exceeds the fair market value. Here's just a very general example um, that came out of that guidance to show how the tax equity structure would look like, and then I'll pass it over to James. Just very generally, typically the carbon capture equipment would be owned in the project partnership and contributed by the developer before it was placed in service, so that when it's placed in service, the, um, the depreciation deductions can be allocated to the members and the credits going forward can be allocated in the example that is provided in the guidance, um, the credits are first predominantly allocated to the investor until it hits its threshold return, and then they flip over to the benefit of the developer until a second flip point, and then they're shared proportionally between the investor and the developer. But very generally, this structure allows the investor to get an initial high rate of return from those credits and also um, later on, partic par potentially participate in the cash flow from the projects if it is a carbon capture project that is generating cash flow. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to James, who's going to talk about capital raising in connection with carbon capture projects and the role of 45Q in that process. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, all of the uh, uh, participants uh, and audience today that as the last speaker, I'm, I'm really flattered that there's still almost 300 people uh, in attendance. So uh, thanks for bearing with us. Um, so, you know, Liz, uh, you know, set the stage for one of the uh, most impactful incentives available for carbon capture today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but also describe some of the other commercial elements that we see as attractive and, uh, you know, helping move this forward as a really economically viable, uh, you know, tool for fighting climate change. So um, I won't spend too much time on this slide. You know, if you take a look at it, we talk about a, uh, you know, an opportunity that's between 35 and $90 billion. That's obviously a really, really wide range. Um, the reason we show this is to uh, convey that uh, two things, really. There's $35 billion worth of capital investment opportunity into CCUS projects that are technically and economically viable for investors today. Now, that $90 billion range is something that can be achieved if there are some improvements to the cost of capture um, from the point it is today. You know, obviously this is expensive uh, technology, but the things that need to happen to all of a sudden unlock a much greater, uh, you know, suite of things that can be captured uh, is really, you know, quite achievable when you think about what the current barriers are. Um, let's move to the next page, please. So um, one thing that we'll talk about is, uh, the, the difference in capturing from concentrated versus dilute streams. Uh, we're actually missing a label in the bottom left box here, but that's to indicate dilute streams from things such as power generation. Um, there's really quite a large difference in the cost of capture from concentrated versus dilute streams, and that's one of the biggest drivers in the economically viable nature of these projects. This uh, flow chart is just showing kind of the commercial flows of things. Um, you know, Liz and, and Tony talked about the difference between credits for utilization versus geologic storage, up to $50 versus $35. Um, and so this is kind of the flow of the 45Q credits as uh, an economic incentive, but it doesn't capture some of the other things that, that may be available. Um, such as 
uh, LCFS credits, which is the uh, California standard that might be uh, used in other states in the future. Um, also, there would be the potential to capture commercial revenues, say, uh, from enhanced oil recovery in selling that CO2. Um, $15 a ton is, is an amount that we put on this page uh, based on you know, economic modeling as well as some history for sales of CO2 that, that currently happen today. Next page, please. So on this chart, this is just to sort of put out some sample numbers to give everyone an idea of the magnitude of what we're talking about. Um, in the concentrated streams at the top, uh, th these are some general estimates from public sources about what the uh, CapEx um, and potential returns would be. So uh, think of these as opportunities that can happen today and can provide double-digit unlevered returns to investors. Uh, so there's a lot of development in projects such as these happening now, ethanol, ammonia, uh, you know, natural gas processing. We're, we're seeing them today and, and our firm is pursuing them. Uh, and it is getting the attention of traditional infrastructure investors because these are returns that they see as attractive as well as the attractiveness of the impact um, of investing in this new asset class because I'm sure many of the people on the call are aware there's a tremendous amount of uh, motivation from the investor community uh, to pursue lower carbon opportunities in their investments. LPs in PE funds are pushing the fund managers to uh, allocate at least a certain portion of their investments to uh, low carbon and decarbonizing infrastructure. Now, if we look down at the bottom section on dilute streams, things such as metals production, cement, gas-fired uh, power generation, uh, these are points where the the concentration of the CO2 is you know, much lower. In many cases, less than 10% of the flue gas stream is going to be CO2. So that's why your capture costs uh, you know, might be in the several hundred million dollars versus less than 100 million in concentrated streams, just because you have to, um, you really have to you know, spend more money for that separation. Um, the reason on this page we have not applicable for the storage in CapEx is because uh, as of today, the assumption is the viable model for most of these dilute streams would require an additional revenue stream such as enhanced oil recovery. So for these generic numbers, we have assumed uh, you know, no CapEx for storage because the CO2 would go to EOR. Uh, now, this does not account for the use of uh, other incentives, such as LCFS, which is generally regionally available for these point source emitters. Uh, but to the extent that uh, something like an LCFS is adopted on a, a national basis or in other regions on a state basis, then these single digit returns could improve. Last thing before we switch pages is um, if you think back to that 35 billion to 90 billion range we talked about a couple pages ago, the reason it's important when thinking about the concentration of the streams is that um, in rough terms, the concentrated streams uh, account for only about 10% of the total industrial emissions of CO2 today. So it's 90% of industrial CO2 emissions that fall into that dilute streams. So when we're able to advance the technology and bring the costs down to really attack the dilute streams better, then that's when you're really going to see a great acceleration, not just of the uh, capital that gets deployed, but also the impact that we can make in capturing CO2. Um, so I won't spend too much time talking about this because it was mentioned by others, uh, but you know, the LCFS, it's a very powerful uh, you know, incentive um, that is really driving a lot of uh, the CO2 activity today, uh, both in terms of uh, 
processes that are in California that can capture the credits locally, uh, as well as direct air capture that qualifies, which Tony mentioned in his discussion, but also um, producers that have access to the California market through uh, transportation of fuel or, or additives. So ethanol, for instance, um, ethanol produced in the Midwest that might be railed to California um, can capture LCFS credits, uh, which is why a lot of them are, are looking at uh, CCUS in places like Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. So this is my final page, and I just wanted to take a few moments to talk about how you know we see capital being deployed along the project development cycle and from different uh, participants. Um, as Liz was describing, the uh, 45Q credits have a lot of similarities to um, the, the credits that were used in the, the wind business in particular, which, which is also from Section 45 of the tax code. Uh, so we do expect that uh, with the availability of those credits and the way it's structured, that there should be a lot of similarities in the capitalization of these projects, including getting into partnership flip models or maybe sale leasebacks for the monetization of the credits, just as the, the wind and, and solar industry has been you know, doing for a couple decades. Um, I, I like to think of the, the capital providers in sort of the higher risk and lower risk appetites. Um, of course, your, your highest risk appetite is going to be the developers themselves who are gonna be putting in the early uh, stage capital as well as you know, the, the, the sweat equity that's going into these things. And they're typically going to be funding things in the pre-feed and feed uh, sections. And when they get into construction where it's going to be you know, you know, tens of millions of dollars, that's when a lot of the uh, you know, smaller developers are going to have to bring in uh, co-investors and partners. Um, there's also strategic investors that get involved early. Uh, my firm is one of them. We, we get involved in that early stage to help de-risk projects. And we see that as a necessary element of advancing this asset class because we have found that uh, where there are private investors who like to originate development stage risk in order to uh, achieve some higher returns, there are other uh, asset classes where they can do that today that are more mature, such as you know wind, solar, uh, you know other types of power generation and infrastructure assets where uh, the development risk might be similar as it is in CCUS, but there's all sorts of other things in CCUS that are new to them. And quite honestly, when they're looking to deploy capital from their funds, all other things being equal, they would rather go with the areas that are proven and you know, you know, easy for them to do the things that are most familiar. Um, our mission and, and those of several other funds that have quite an impact focus is to really see an acceleration of capital deployed into this asset class because that CO2 reduction impact is extremely important to us. In the case of our fund, uh, you know, the impact is a higher level goal than just the return of capital to our investors. Um, once you get beyond the feed stage and you're ready to begin construction, um, that's where you're into the lower risk uh, stage, where I think the, the capital providers are going to be a lot of the usual suspects that you've seen in infrastructure investing. Uh, corporates and strategics will have interest in coming in a little bit earlier. They typically uh, are very comfortable with uh, taking on construction risk. And I think as more of the CCUS projects are built and operated, they will uh, see that there's not much differentiation in that construction risk than there are in more traditional asset classes. Um, private equity and infrastructure funds um, are finding this to be an interesting uh, asset class because they have seen their returns get squeezed down as uh, things like renewables have become more and more mature and commoditized. And uh, you know the opportunity to earn several hundred basis points more on a 
low carbon infrastructure project is something that's quite attractive to them. Um, lenders will uh, obviously come in for construction loans. In many cases, you'll have lenders that will convert those construction loans into project level debt. If there might be tax equity, um, and in many cases there will be, uh, a lot of that debt will be done on a back leverage basis. And then as far as operating companies, um, particularly some of these really large projects that will have a, a very large storage facility that requires operation and monitoring of uh, companies like Oxy Low Carbon Ventures that, that have a lot of expertise to bring to bear. Uh, I think you will see operators that want to come in for uh, an equity stake as well as just providing operations on a fee-for-service basis. And, and then finally, tax equity. Uh, where they, they do have equity risk, just as Liz was describing. But those of you who are not familiar with tax equity and renewables, they do have a fairly uh, low risk appetite. So uh, in just about every case, tax equity um, will not fund until a project is going into operations. They will make commitments earlier during the construction stage. But typically they are not going to start funding until uh, the project is commissioned. So they're often going to be the last money that, that comes in. Uh, I think that takes me to the end of my slides. And um, I believe, uh, JJ, we we're going to do some joint Q&A. Liz, a couple of questions have come in for you from the audience. Um, I'll tie a couple of them together. Dr. Romanek had made a statement um, concerning false positives. Uh, in terms of leakage concerns, um, you know, do you have an initial reaction as, as to the potential for recapture risk this poses? Also, um, you know, how is the leakage measured with certainty? I think was another question. Are leaks monitored at the agency level or are they self-reported? Thanks, JJ. Those are great questions. Um, it's really important to integrate the different disciplines that are involved here you know, we're talking about the federal tax credits and the qualification for those credits. And earlier we talked about, you know, the, the geological qualities and the ability to measure <clears throat> leakage of CO2 from these projects. And it, it really raises it, bringing together the dis different disciplines to assess the risk to investors who are interested in the 45Q credits from a project. Um, tying it together with what James was talking about, um, the evolving technology to identify risk, to identify leakage, to try to quantify the risk that you might lose credits or they may be recaptured, and in investors' willingness to put capital into a project um, where a large part of their return will be um, in the form of credits, all kind of rolled together. And I think it's an evolving area as that technology and understanding of leakage gets better, it mitigates the risk uh, people perceive in the loss of credits. And I think over time will increase investors' comfort. Um, but, but certainly that is, a, that is a, an evolving area uh, that you know, really brings together multiple, multiple expertise. Okay, a couple more. Um... Kind of tax questions coming in, legislation, regulatory question. Uh, you know, where where do these tax policies come from? You know, does Congress have to act to promulgate the policies, or are they done at the agency level? You know, the IRS or the EPA. Great, that's a great question, JJ. Uh, of course, forty five Q is part of the federal income tax code, so that is federal legislation. But the guidance that has come out subsequently. Um, from the IRS and Treasury in the form of proposed regulations and then final regulations, um, also in the form of uh, rulings and notices. Um, and we expect more to be coming out over time from the Treasury and the IRS elaborating on issues that weren't fully addressed in the final regulations, things such as commercial uses of, um, of carbon oxide. So that, that guidance, um, 45Q, may be further amended, um, and that would, you know, require uh, an act Congress uh, to take on those issues. And one of the things that is being talked about is converting 45Q from a credit 
to being a direct pay option. So in other words, we wouldn't need structures like tax equity partnerships because the owner of the carbon capture equipment didn't have um, tax liability because the credits wouldn't be available just to offset tax liability, but could be converted into actual cash payments. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that's some, certainly something that people have proposed. Um, and we expect further guidance uh, to be coming from the Treasury and the IRS. And uh, what's really important is what you touched on earlier, JJ, is what about the EPA and the Department of Energy? Well, 45Q is a really interesting code section in that um, some of the more detailed provisions that I didn't go into in a lot of detail today talk about um, measuring and monitoring um, uh, geological sequestration of CO2 as well as life cycle analysis for the purpose of measuring carbon oxide that is used um, in a process or product. And the, those standards and those measurements um, all tie into EPA standards, and they are um, evaluated by the EPA under those standards. So really, it's a very multidisciplinary approach to determining if those credits are available. I work very closely with my corporate colleagues, um, Jason Hutt and Jeff Homestead. Jeff Homestead, who's very far along working on these classics permits for secure geological storage, um, as well as consultants to work together to try to apply the rules and these measurements um, that are available um, by EPA standards. And in the case of life cycle analysis for CO2 utilization, that is actually a report that needs to be submitted and reviewed by the EPA and DOE and signed off on by the IRS before a taxpayer even uh, claims the credits. So there are multiple agencies involved. Okay, I think that's it on the tax questions. We're running out of time here. Liz, did you have any questions for James? Uh, sure, sure. I'll ask a question for James. James, how much do you hear people talking about the insurance market and what kind of role do you think that's going to play in terms of tax credits? Yeah, I, I, do, uh, I do hear a fair amount of discussion about the, the role of insurance. And the discussions usually fall into two different categories. Um, you know, one is something that was mentioned earlier in the session about uh, insurance around the recapture risk due to leakage or environmental activity. But um, there is also a discussion about, um, you know, an insurance for the actual qualification of the credits, uh, just because it, this is a fairly new application. Um, and so there are questions around, well, what, um, you know, what types of activity uh, for qualifying for start of construction and continuous efforts, um, you know, will um, allow projects to claim those credits. It's something that, you know, we've seen in wind and solar for years about, you know, the difference between qualifying for start of construction with uh, a safe harbor spend versus doing uh, what they call work of a significant nature. So a lot of those same questions are being uh, raised uh, primarily by investors who have already experienced some of those things in the renewable industry. James, this uh, this past summer, um, you know, you spoke at another webinar, and it you know it sounded like you know kind of the the pre feed the feed investors, the developers, um, you know, the seed capital stage was you know a little bit more, I guess you could say, congealed versus kind of this post feed um, type investors, uh, the tax equity, et cetera. I mean, do you see that market evolving more now? I mean, is it, I, I'm guessing it's still behind uh, the, the, the pre-feed, but just curious your, your take on, on where that market's headed. Yeah, I do see it developing. Um, you know, just anecdotally from conversations that I have uh, with um, investors that are typically looking to come in later on other asset classes, they, they're, they're starting to pay more attention to, uh, you know, to these uh, types of assets. Now, of course, there's not that many that are at the stage where they're ready to close the, the longer term operating financing. So there's a lot of investors that are getting ready for a couple reasons. One is, uh, as I was discussing before, there's a lot of pressure from their LPs uh, saying, look, you know, I want you to spend 
30, you know, at least 30 percent of your capital on low carbon opportunities. Uh, I've spoken with some funds that have traditionally uh, been primarily focused on hydrocarbon invest investments. And as they're going out raising new funds, a lot of investors that have been with them for, for years and multiple funds are declining to invest in a new hydrocarbon fund. Um, so that has, to some extent, um, you know, given rise to the energy transition funds that, that we are seeing being raised by fund managers who are uh, historically traditional, uh, you know, energy investors. Um, so that, so that, that's one reason. The other reason is that um, the typical energy invest in investments, not so much oil and gas, but really different types of power generation, whether conventional or renewable, um, the returns are just not that attractive anymore because it's become such a mature asset class. So uh, there, there are a lot of U.S.-based investors who don't find the single-digit returns from a utility-scale solar farm to be you know, really all that attractive uh, anymore. So they are looking for diversification and a way to, uh, you know, increase their returns by investment to their LPs. Hey, hey, while we're waiting for Owen, I just wanted to, to note that there have been some questions on carbon pricing and the Climate Leadership Council where I'm involved was the founding members in addition to Secretary of State James Baker and George Schultz. Another founding member, Janet Yellen, and she is a strong supporter of carbon pricing. Additional founding members, of course, are Exxon, Shell, BP, Microsoft, you name it. But Yellen has come out as a strong proponent of carbon pricing. So if anybody is interested in more details about the Yellen plan, which is starting to get legs, go to the Climate Leadership Council website and you will get information about that. Because as I said, I saw, I saw some questions uh, asking what the likelihood of carbon pricing as a possible driver. And again, it's very compatible with CCS because once you set the price, then there is an economic incentive for creativity and all, all creativity is going to burst loose. I'm wondering if I can add something to this discussion. Is this, can yes. I? Great time. Yeah, we're, we've got about okay. five minutes. Great. Um, so, so I want to go back to the point that was um, Ben had mentioned about the EPA regulations, and then there was a question about the false positives and and um, and the recapture for 45Q. I just want to say that you know what's real interesting about CCS monitoring is that you know most of the emissions accounting in global regulations is done by emissions factors. So most of the accounting is just, you know, you have a process and you just assign an emissions factor to it. But early on in CCS regulations, it was understood that geology is different from site to site. And so we can't really put an emissions factor on CO2 storage. We, ha we have to directly monitor it. And so that's when all of the regulations came online for, okay, so how do you monitor it? How, how are we going to go about doing that? And I'm going to say that, again, in Dixon and Romanek 2015 and in another paper coming out, Romanek and Dixon, you know, we've really looked at these global regulations. And what we're finding out is that, yes, I'm going to say that the technical um, requirements of many of these regulations are not based in the research, okay? Um, so, so there's a little bit of a di disconnect there. But what I want to say is that these regulations are working because the operator and the regulator sit down and they talk to each other and they work through it and they are able to kind of, you know, work through what's going to work for them. And so where is the regular, I don't want people to be frightened by this. Um, the bottom line is that regulations are not prescriptive on what techniques you need to use to monitor. Um, but and, and that's really the place where the researchers know the most, right? But um, and then that requires the regulator and the project operator to have some kind of a knowledge of the science of these approaches and these monitoring approaches. But 
I think that, you know, this is what this webinar is showing. It's showing that we all talk to each other. We're all interacting with each other. And in the mm -hmm. end, the regulations are working. We have projects moving forward. So I, I don't want you to be frightened by the fact that maybe some of these regulations are not really based in scientific reality. The bottom line is we're all talking, we're working it out, and projects are moving forward. Okay. Yeah, we want to uh, thank all those who attended today. Um, I think we covered what we set out to accomplish, what Pam and I put together with the Energy Center. Uh, we, you know, we hit CCUS from the important angles, policy and, and regulatory, commercial and economics. Um, it's a big topic, I think, as you know, we, we've learned today. Uh, it's rapidly evolving. Um, you know, we got a lot of questions answered. There's a lot of questions that haven't been answered. We'll work with the Energy Center to get with the with the presenters and, and try to get these questions answered. Um, and I want to thank each of the presenters for their time today and for the effort putting putting the slides together. Uh, Pam, anything else we need to cover here? We've got just a couple of minutes. Oh, I think you I think you nailed it, and and I'm I'm just so thrilled with the attendance, and apparently available to everybody. And then we're going to strive to type answers to all of the questions. And then just stay in touch. You've got the contact information for the various speakers, and you know I'm sure they're happy to answer questions. Well, thanks again to the 300 or so some odd people that joined this morning. It's really cool to see such wide interest mm -hmm. in this topic. Yeah, it's it's wide interest, and and I will tell you, it's uh, it's it's some significant folks in the industry. So um, that's it from uh, Energy Week here. Over and out. Uh, thanks all for for attending.